Welcome to Unleashed with Eva Melton, where we unleash spiritual principles for victorious living. Hey everybody, welcome back to Unleashed with Eva Melton here on 101.1 FM. We are happy to join you this Sunday. I want to remind you that this episode is sponsored by Clifford Melton of Keller Williams Realty. So if you're looking to buy or purchase, um, sell a property, look at CliffordMelton.com, CliffordMelton.com, and he can help you with all of your realtor needs. Well, today I have with me one of my ministry brothers, uh, Reverend Dave Barnhart. I call him Dave. Um, and I was thinking back to first, Dave, how are you today? I'm doing great. How about you? Good. And so I was tracing back, like, how did I meet Dave? Because I just realized we, I looked up one day and Dave and I were just in a lot of the same spaces. Yeah. And it was through Reverend Dr. Sandra Coleman. Oh. And she could not sit on a panel for the Open Society Foundation. She recommended you. I mean, she recommended that I reach out to you, I think. And at the same time, she told me about your book, which took me almost two years <laughs> to get my hands on. Right. But that's literally how I came in contact with you. Oh, and I'm glad that I did. And the fact that I can remember that. I'm impressed. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I just like, I've, I've known you forever. <laughs> I know. And so, Dave, I want you to tell everybody who you are in your own way. Sure. Um, I'm Dave Barnhart. I'm a pastor and church planter. Um, I uh, live in Birmingham and am pastor of St. Junia United Methodist Church, which is a network of house churches. We started doing that about, started doing house churches about three years ago, mm -hmm. although we actually started planting about seven years ago before I figured out what I was doing. Um, I still, well, let me be honest, I still sometimes am we don't figure know. out what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I've also uh, earned a PhD from Vanderbilt University, so I've done some teaching as well, um, both in seminary and undergraduate uh, environments. I'm married and I have a son who's almost 16. And uh, Wow. Yes. Wow. Right. Um, so house churches. Yeah. How, how do we get to this model? Because I think it's phenomenal. But how do we get to this model? Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for asking about that. Well, it's interesting because a lot of times when I tell people that I'm doing house churches or when my members tell people they're part of a house church, they get there's about three questions they get. One is, is that like a real church? <laughs> and then they say, do you have like a real pastor? <laughs> And then they'll say, is it a cult? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I, I actually really lo love that response because it, it allows for a teaching moment because uh, we all started from house churches. I mean, the first century, first three centuries of the church were, right. were house churches. And it wasn't until uh, 300, well, after 300 uh, A.D. that um, uh, churches had buildings. They mm -hmm. met in people's homes. Um, and it's interesting, too, the way that Paul refers to their homes, uh, the way he refers to those churches is like the church that meets in Nympha's house or the church that meets in Prisca and Aquila's house mm -hmm. when he sends his greetings. And mo a lot of those leaders are women. So I think in a lot of ways, you know, by having the church meet in homes, especially in that first century, mm -hmm. it was a disruptive model. Wow. Most of the religious uh, centers were either pagan temples, which were really flashy, you know, mm -hmm. they were the mega churches of the day, or the synagogues. Mm -hmm. So meeting in, in homes was, in a way, it was it's out of the eye of the empire. So you, it, and it's a little subversive. And of course, Christianity was illegal for the free, first three hundred years, and it spread like wildfire. Hmm. Uh, the other, the other piece is that uh, I'm I'm United Methodist, and so um, when Methodists were doing their church planting business back during the Great Awakening in in the United States, um, they had small congregations that often met in homes, and they would go from place to place. So they would have a circuit. They were called circuit riders, and they would have three or four five different churches that they would go around to and it's it's funny because everything old is new again that's what i'm doing wow yeah that's awesome and so you have mm -hmm. a, a, a house church that's tentatively, tentatively coming in hospital that's correct. can we talk about that just a little bit sure sure yeah um so it's it's interesting because most of these um the, the idea behind the house churches is that they reproduce uh, organically. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to keep it very simple so it's mm -hmm. easy to reproduce. They can meet without me, so they don't need to have professional full-time clergy there um, making everything happen because it's very lay-led. Lay uh, the members drive it. And when they grow to a certain size, usually there will be a, um, a household, uh, a few people who say, hey, we feel called to go start another house church. Or maybe they just, maybe they move, mm -hmm. right? And they want to take that with them. So that's the way the five that we have in Birmingham have started. Um, the one in Huntsville is unique because this is, you know, these is people coming together and reaching out to us. Hey, would you help us get a house church started? Wow. And, and that has been happening more and more. So um, I've been in phone conversations with people in North Carolina and Florida and um, 
Indiana, um, a lot of other places where people are saying, hey, we're intrigued by this, we'd like to do it. Now, I need to point out that people have been doing house churches for a long time. It's the dominant form of church in China and a lot of the world. So it's not like it's like not like I invented this or something like that. And but it is unique from mainline denominations to right. do this, um, because typically we have just an establishment mindset. That's right. It takes us a quarter million dollars to start a church. Like we're going to go buy <laughs> property and hire a band and pay a full time clergy person, and that's not what I think it it it. It's like the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good description yeah. of it. I mean, that's how I feel. Well, you know, kind of how I've just started um, church planting and, and the way that I went about doing it, just really kind of stepping away from the heaviness of it. Yeah. And just focusing in on people. Right. And believing as people come, the, the budget comes. And to me, that's just a, a lot freer for my mind mm-hmm. to do it that way versus let's build it and they will come because right. sometimes you build it and they don't come. Sure. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also think it, it flips on, on over our models of success. So when you have an, an establishment church and they're deciding they're going to create a new church, the way they determine if it's a success is if that church can sustain a full-time paid clergy person. Right. Like that's the person we pay to be the most Christian, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> and look, look, I have a PhD. I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of higher education. Me too. Uh, I think it's important. You know, and I, I also am I'm very conscious that sometimes without a system of accountability, there right. can be pastoral misconduct, mm-hmm. or neglect, or mm-hmm. spiritual malpractice, whatever right. you call it. So for me, that's why it's important to be part of a mainline denomination. Mm-hmm. But um, it, as long as you're looking for, through that establishment lens, mm. it's like the way we judge success is how big are you? Wow. And that really, oh gosh, it seeps into everything, right? Anyway. Oh, that's a great, I think we could talk about Mm-hmm. House churches and church planning all day, Dave. Oh, I sure. think we can. <laughs> um, so you talked about um, your son. Mm-hmm. Um, I have in my hand, for those of you who are listening, um, Dave's <laughs> book, God Shows No Partiality. And, and those words are on a bumper sticker on the back of a car. Uh, it's a very cool book. Uh, it is broken down into six chapters with a great introduction and Dave you talked about your son yeah. and so that just made me think about the introduction to your book but right. um, one of the things you talked about is that the Bible shouldn't be used as a weapon can you kind of talk through that story oh, about sure. how you right. came to that point with your son yeah yeah well so that's sort of been a theme of my of my ministry and um, because I really feel like I, I want I want the Bible to be something that heals people mm-hmm. uh, the sal- salvation salve means healing mm. and um and people do often use it to exclude and to harm. Yes. So, uh, in the story, I w- we were going to the park. I was at I was a associate pastor at Trinity Methodist Church in Homewood. So we were going to the Homewood Park, mm-hmm. and he's he was imitating me. He had like a typewriter, and he would say, "I'm writing my sermons." I was just you know made my heart feel so. <laughs> and so he said, uh, "Can I take my Bible?" And I was like, "Of course, you can take your Bible." <laughs> you know. So he has this little tote bag because it's like he's imitating me taking my briefcase to church. And so, mm-hmm. so he puts his Bible in his tote bag and we go to, the, go to the park and he meets this little girl at the park. He starts playing with her. He's, I think he's five years old or so. Mm-hmm. And they play with each other for a while. And I sit over on the bench and I'm doing some reading. I look up a little while later and he's on top of the monkey bars and she's down below kind of playing in the, in the mulch or something. And he's got this tote bag. And he's aiming it at her head, and he <laughs> drops it right on her head. Bonk. Of course, she starts wailing and crying. And I'm like, oh, come on. So I get up, and I walk over, and her mother comes across, and she says, oh, it was just an accident. And I said, no, I wish I could say it was an accident, but he he was aiming. <laughs> and so you know, I picked it up, and I, and I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity for a teachable moment, right? <laughs> so I pulled the Bible out, and I said, buddy, if you're going to use this as a weapon, mm-hmm. I can't let you have it, right? And I, I slipped it into my bag. And he looked at me, and, and he was really hurt. I could tell in his eyes he was really hurt. And he screwed up his little face, and he said, You can't take God's word away from me! <laughs> and, like, everyone in the park like, turns around and looks at me. And I'm like, oh, great. And he let me. He started ripping me up one side and down the other. He mm-hmm. was like, You're supposed to teach people about God, and now you're taking this Bible away from me. But, you know. And so I, he was throwing a tantrum, so I said, Okay, we got to go. So we're start walking out the out the park and there's this little 10 year old boy or so who's holding the door open for us and as we're walking out he's shouting at me you wicked wicked man you can't keep me from learning about god 
<laughs> and this 10 year old I'm sure he's like oh, isn't that the preacher and his eyes are really big and he's looking at me anyway so uh. classic you know um, classic example but what I, I, I do like to say though is that um, I don't find my son's response that different mm. from adult Christians when I say don't use the Bible as a weapon mm-hmm. and I'm going to give you a different way to hear this passage or I'm going to use this I'm going to use these texts that you've been using to hurt people. I'm going to flip them around and see how you like it on the other side. Oh, wow. Right? And and that same tantrum reaction, like, I'm a bad person. I'm going to hell because I've made them uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what I get from folks sometimes. Mm-hmm. So. Wow. Wow. And so let me ask you this. Uh, I know you said that this has been the theme of your ministry, but Mm -hmm. when you wrote this book, you know, I always ask people, okay, why was this book appropriate for you to write at that time? What was going on with Dave when you wrote this book? Yeah. Well, so uh, I'm in the United Methodist Church, and Mm -hmm. as you know, you've probably seen the news, United Methodist Church is about to split Mm -hmm. over uh, LGBTQ issues, Mm -hmm. marriage and, and ordination. And I was about to go start a church. And I've, I had heard too many churches um, talk about welcoming, but it was kind of a bait and switch. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get you in here, and then we're going to we're going to hurt you. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted I wanted to have a way to show people I'm not going to hurt them. Yeah. And so I wanted to write this book to give a clear theological basis for why I'm saying what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You've been listening to Unleashed with Eva Melton. We're going to go into a break. We're here today with Dave Barnhart discussing his book God Shows No Partiality. We'll catch you on the other side. Welcome back to Unleashed with Eva Melton. I'm here today with Dave Barnhart discussing his book, God Shows No Partiality. Dave, I want you to tell my listeners, number one, I forgot to ask you, Mm -hmm. how can we find your book and how can they find you on social media? Sure thing. So on the book, uh, the book's available on Amazon. So you can just go look up God Shows No Partiality. Um, there, uh, I've contributed to a couple of other books called, one's called What's in the Bible About Church, uh, which is Abingdon. And, um, then there's another one that's, um, called Living Faithfully, uh, Homosexuality in the United Methodist Church Mm -hmm. Debate. Um, and that was released in 2017. That's also through Abingdon. Both of those are on Amazon as well. And, but just search God Shows No Partiality. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Now, you said that this God Shows No Partiality is like a slogan, like the yeah. slogan of the early church. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, it kind of hit me when I started looking at, uh, you see this phrase crop up again and again throughout the New Testament. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't, my theory is that this was a slogan the early church used a lot. Um, so it f- shows up in Acts uh, when Peter meets Cornelius in mm-hmm. Acts chapter 10. And he says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. Um, and uh, then you hear Paul use it in his letters. He uses it in Galatians. And he James has sort of a riff on it when he talks about if you show partiality, is that good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it's in the Gospels when Jesus is confronted uh, by someone who's trying to t- uh, test him. And they say, we understand you're a good teacher and you show no partiality right right and so um it it, that must have been a refrain Mm. that the early church was using Mm -hmm. because they were creating these these communities that were very egalitarian Mm -hmm. uh that were very countercultural, and uh one of the big struggles for the early church was are are jewish folks jewish christians going to accept these gentile right right and you know, they in a lot of ways. They, I'm going to just say they had some very good reasons not to, right? Because, mm-hmm. well, hey, are you saying it's okay if we eat meat, meat sacrificed to idols? You know, are you saying that's in the mm-hmm. dispute in Corinthians? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's interesting the way that Paul and other authors have to kind of step gingerly through this because they want to tell people, look, it's not bad that you observe these rules, but those rules don't necessarily apply to everybody, right? And I think that's really hard. I think it's hard for Christians today to understand that, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> that look, you know, this if sinning against your own conscience is bad. So if you think something's bad and you do it anyway because of peer pressure. So Paul talks about that in, in Corinthians, mm-hmm. that that hurts your own conscience, that hurts your relationship with God. But maybe it isn't bad. 
You know, maybe eating meat sacrificed to idols doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. In which case, why are you putting this burden on other people? Mm-hmm. The big controversy in the early church was, you know, if, if you're a 30-year-old Gentile man and they say, you know, uh, you, you want to come join this church. And I say, well, first you have to get circumcised. Mm-hmm. And, you, and they go, whoa, that's a deal breaker. You know? <laughs> it should be. <laughs> um, right. So, so um, and, and with, when you read the New Testament, a huge amount of it is about circumcision. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and, and really trying to get people to, to, to deal with this. That was, that was the issue of their day. Yeah. Right. And so this phrase, God shows no partiality, God shows no partiality, I think was a way of trying to help people understand that we can live together um, and you don't have to change this other person. Right. God's the judge of this other person. You don't have to. Fix Thank them. you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Why are you trying to fix other people? Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I think. And that's so hard for us to do. Yeah. I, um, you know, just being in church planning, number one, being a woman. Um, out doing this and there's no I'm not like hiding behind a man right right? I don't have a husband and I get just a lot of questions Mm -hmm. you know just assumptions and questions and I finally got to the point where you realize people ask certain questions Mm -hmm. they would want you to show partiality because of power dynamics Mm, 100% and they just need to know where you stand so they know what side of the power dynamic are you on Mm -hmm. in order for them to accept you and that's very manipulative in my opinion you know like you got to hear me say a certain thing a certain way before you're with me and you know they don't get that so talk to me just a little bit about I I think you you covered it in the book but I want you to just kind of talk about those power dynamics and why people want us to be to show partiality right yeah Man, that, I think you're absolutely right. And I, it's interesting how that, you mentioned how that happens linguistically, mm-hmm. right? The way that someone talks about God gives me a clue about their theology and their politics. And like, if I say, how are you doing? And someone says, you know, the Lord's just blessing me, right? I've already made some assumptions <laughs> about what kind of church you come from, but what your background is, you know, the whole thing, right? Or or if uh, someone says, better than I deserve, right? I already, I already know where you're coming from, okay? Um, it, it, and, and it's you know that's like the battle that we have over Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like if I hear if if you say the wrong word or you s- use this phrase inappropriately, I've already made judgments about mm-hmm. where where you fit in my world view. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of us learn how to code switch, right? So, but one of the things that for me, like I don't when I talk about God, I don't say He a lot. Mm. I use inclusive language. That's awesome, Dave. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I, and some people like. Like if I say God, if I use she as a pronoun for God, mm-hmm. um, I don't necessarily do it to torque somebody else, right? right? Um, because sometimes to me, God feels like a maternal figure, mm-hmm. right? God accepts me, loves me, wraps God's arms around me, mm-hmm. and you know, as a as a as a straight guy, when I think about having a romantic relationship about God, mm-hmm. it's weird for me to say God He. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that's the case for everybody, but right. you know, when we gather in, in a in a building and we sing. Um, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. You know, it's a wonderful song. But a woman singing that who's straight has a different uh, emotional response than I have to that. You know, but God is a lover. God woos us. God draws us in. God wants that intimacy with us. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, man, how much how much do I lose if I'm afraid to call God she? Oh, yes. You know? Yeah. Anyway, and I know that's probably going to rub some people the wrong way. But, I, but that's why we're here. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> <Got it. laughs> you know, but, but, but it really is. It, so you, and you, when you listen to people, you, as you're saying, people ask questions to kind of figure out where to put you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just having that come back. God shows no partiality. Mm-hmm. What can I learn from this person mm-hmm. who's different than me? Rather than making assumptions about their value, <laughs> you know, and where they come from and how they relate to me. So. That's right. That's right. Um, that was good. That was very good. Um, you talked about, and I don't know what chapter it was in, but it was the gospel without agenda. Mm-hmm. So it's talking about Jesus. You know, I'm a Jesus mm-hmm. freak. So right. um, the gospel with without agenda. Mm-hmm. And so as I say that back to you, what comes to your mind? Mm-hmm. Man, I, I think, again, it's it's... First of all, I do want to say I think the gospel does have an agenda, <laughs> but I think oftentimes we we take we take good news, mm-hmm. this radically good news, and we want to give people part of it, but we don't want them. It's like I don't want you to have too much good news, right? I don't want you to feel too empowered. I don't want you to feel too confident in your own salvation, right? And so, 
so in order to maintain those that power differential, I'm going to present to you the gospel in a certain way, such that in order for you to buy into it, you have to you have to buy into all this other baggage that I'm bringing to the table. Whew. You know, um, keep them bags of chips. Yeah. So, <laughs> like like when I think about how how I want. This goes back to church planning. Mm-hmm. Right? My call is to reach people who are who are not going to set foot into a church. That's right. People who have been hurt by church, burned by church, and in especially in the South, if I, if a, a lot of people who I think they have good intentions, they want to be evangelists. But mm-hmm. they basically, want you to become uh, a white Republican before you can become a Christian. <laughs> you know, and so it's like if if you if you come from a different perspective, mm-hmm. like you have a different experience different uh um set of values mm-hmm. then um it's like the jews and jews and gentiles that's right right i i don't need to impose uh my culture on you for you to be able to hear the good news because i think it's good news for everybody that's good news you know? that's good stuff yeah. day <laughs> that, is, that is good stuff and one of the things that you pointed out that i you know caught in seminary was in the book of luke <clears throat> Just how women were treated, mm-hmm. presented mm-hmm. in the book of Luke by, you know, by Jesus as the writer documents it. Yes. Talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. Well, so in Luke, that's that's where I, you know, that's really the most feminist gospel that we have mm-hmm. because it, it talks about women a whole bunch. Yes. Um, you know, Luke's the one that's most explicit about women being the one. Of course, they all talk about women being the first ones to, to bring the message. But, mm-hmm. you know, Luke has this um, words about the women who are following Jesus, who provided for them out of their resources. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have uh, you have the story of, of Mary and Martha there. Um, and, of course, John's got Mary and Martha, too. But mm-hmm. but Luke really emphasizes the, the role of women mm-hmm. in the development of this early movement. And then you see that again in Acts, right? So right. as Luke is writing part two, Acts, right. <laughs> women are all through it. Um, and um, I, I think just like with talking about early church and house churches, um, there's something powerful that happens when we, I, I, excuse me, I can't say let women lead, but you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? As mm-hmm. a church, we acknowledge the Holy Spirit present in women's leadership already, right? And that, um, you know, I mean, how, how, again, I understand people come from different traditions, but women were the first ones to tell about the resurrection. They were the first event, first evangelists right um so why am i going to prevent someone from preaching or why am i going to prevent someone from from spreading the good news or say you can only tell children about this Mm -hmm. women have meant such an have played such an important role in my faith development Mm -hmm. um i got a quick quick story i was sitting in the board of ordain ministry we're interviewing candidates right and um I thought I was being kind of enlightened because I'm talking to uh, to the to the women like, okay, if someone challenges your ministry, how are you going to respond? And I'm hoping that they're going to cite Deborah and um, you know quote quote the Bible and kind of be challenging. And uh, one of the candidates walked out and I said, you know, I just wish she would she would be a little more aggressive about you know sharing this. And okay. uh, one of the women said, uh, uh, you're you're imposing your male ideas on how she should respond to you. You know, and that was kind of stunning to me. It's like, oh yeah, even when I'm trying to be helpful and I'm affirming, out of my privilege. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Dave, I have enjoyed just this short period of time with you. We should definitely do this again, Dave. Um, the book we've been discussing today is "God Shows No Partiality." You can find the book on Amazon as well as some of his other work. Um, he's on Facebook. I think he's on Instagram. I know he's on Twitter. So look up Saint Junior. Or look up Dave Barnhart. Um, but I think Saint Junior is about to take the state for the for Jesus <laughs> for Jesus. And so I'm just glad that you were able to join me today. This has been Eva Melton. We'll catch you next Sunday on. 101.1. Thanks for listening to Unleash with Eva. I hope you were inspired, encouraged, and motivated to tackle a new week. For more information about the show, check out www.evamelton.com. 